The title this morning is Beyond a Blueprint Picture of God, and that's a title I'll explain a little bit, A Message on the Problem of Suffering, A Brief Roadmap. Um, every year when we do tough questions, we, we take writing questions in the fall, and every year, the problem of suffering, if God is loving, why is there so much suffering? If God is loving and powerful, why do we have wars and famines? Why is evil so prevalent? This question every year is right at the top of the list in terms of the most asked question. And we have a couple of times taken stabs at this, so there's been a couple kind of one-off messages. But just praying over this year, it felt like we need to go deeper. We need to really press into the heartbeat of this question. And it is, this is maybe the toughest of the tough questions uh, that I think followers of Jesus face. And so we're going to spend three weeks this year. This week is going to be beyond a blueprint picture of God, uh, really looking at what the sovereignty of God means. And so this will be a little bit more of a mind message, just a warning for the next 30 minutes. You will survive, but a little bit more mind. Next week is going to be suffering and spiritual warfare. And if you know someone who's suffering, I think next week would be a great week to bring them. We're going to talk about the battle that, that suffering is and maybe the reasons behind that battle, and what God is doing in that battle. And then the final week is going to be following Jesus in a world full of suffering. Very practical, very equipping message. Uh, I hope that will equip us to uh, just live as a community in the world that is experiencing suffering. As we go through this series, uh, my prayer is not just that we would come to a better mental understanding of evil, injustice, and suffering, uh, but my prayer is that we would be mobilized as a community to engage the works of darkness in our day and in our time. That we would be a mobilized people, not just passively accepting or, or theoretically understanding, but actually working against suffering and darkness in, in our day and in our time. Um, this year, this question is really, really fresh for me. Uh, in, just in 2013, which is not an old year yet, uh, one of my good friends who I have spent almost endless hours with walked away from faith as a result of their mother's death. Uh, just could not put the pieces together after a long battle with cancer and it was like the back was broken on their faith. Another person who I prayed with a lot at Coast said that as a result of their parents living in each other, they just have no longer been able to pray. This experience of loss just felt devastating to faith. In 2004, Coast took a team to Thailand and we were in the Mela refugee camp, a Karen refugee camp on the border between Thailand and Burma. And one day, part of our team went to an orphanage where many of the kids had experienced wounding from landmines. And so there were kids whose bodies had been blown apart, kids without limbs, kids even whose torsos were just re shaped terribly, terribly disfigured kids. And we worshiped, we prayed for the kids. And then after that, I went up on a hillside and our two boys were with us and they were playing um, in a torrential rain. They were playing a soccer game with refugee camp kids. And one of my closest friends in the world and I were sitting on this hillside just watching kids play soccer. And, and in my mind were just these pictures of little four-year-olds' bodies blown apart by landmines who were still alive but were experiencing day-to-day -day agony without any kind of good medical relief. And then my friend sitting next to me just doubled over and started heaving sobs, like heaving. And he said, I have to tell you something. He was on his honeymoon, and his wife is, was on the executive team for Love 146, which is the, you know, the organization we're working with out there that combats human trafficking. And, and the previous week, he said, I, I just have to unload this. And he said, he described going in, he had gone into a, a brothel that trafficked children in order to 
collect information for an organization that would help release them from the brothel. So he had posed as a customer. And he sat there on the hill and told me about what it was like to go into a brothel and to look through a glass window at little kids with numbers hanging on their necks and then to have to name a number for a specific kid. And 146 is one of those numbers from a child. That's why the organization is named Love 146. And we sat on the hillside together, and as he told me what actually happened... I felt like, you know, it's like the floor of the universe just was giving way underneath me. Like, where are you, God? How, how can there be a real God in a world where these things are happening? If you're alive, God, why, why don't you see this? Last year, in this room... Just almost one year ago, we did a memorial service for Jacob Lower, and a number of us in the hospital just days before that were celebrating Jacob's life, the son of Robin Kelly Lower, who are out organizing Love 146 Project right now, and they had such a beautiful boy who had a rare kidney disorder, and In the hospital, as we prayed for him, I don't think I've ever felt more strongly what a precious gift life is. And we all knew that it would take a miracle for him even to live a day with his disorder. And hours after he was born, he went home to be with the Lord. And there's just a a great mysterious why that rises up and a pain that does not just go away. And so as we press into this topic, I know that for some of us it's, it's very fresh, for others of us it's a little distant, but for all of us I believe it is a crucial life question to be able to live in a world of, of suffering and, and to engage that, to navigate through the suffering in this world. Let's pray and, and then walk into Scripture. Lord, I ask as we look at your word that you would pour out your spirit on us. Lord, I ask that you would pour your love into the places we need it the most. And Lord, I ask that you would show us grace, show us love, show us what your cross means this morning. And Lord, I ask that you would move us to join you. the battle against the powers and principalities of this fallen world. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to begin with what Greg Boyd calls the blueprint worldview. I think that uh, Greg Boyd is onto something that some of our real trouble around this question, uh, especially in America right now, has to do with what he calls the blueprint worldview. Let me just sketch this. It's a one picture of God's sovereignty. It's not the only picture of God's sovereignty, but, but here's how it goes uh, briefly. Uh, the beginning is that God is all-powerful and never changes. The Bible cover to cover teaches that God is an all-powerful God. First Chronicles 29 says, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power, the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Jeremiah 32, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Revelation 1 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who the Lord says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So there's this picture in the Bible that God is all-powerful and that God is unchanging. James chapter 1 says, Father of lights, every good and perfect gift comes from you. In you, there is no shifting or shadow. There is no turning or change. So, uh, a biblical teaching. God's all-powerful and never changes. But a second piece of the blueprint worldview, what Boyd calls the blueprint worldview, God has a reason for everything. 
And so here's the idea that God, God's all-powerful. God is before all time and after all time. God is in many ways timeless. And God has designed everything in the world according to what we might call a divine blueprint. And that if you were to zoom in on any part of that blueprint, you would see that God has a reason for those events. So that in God's power, God has designed everything that happened in history. Augustine uh, really was an early champion of this. Augustine wrote, the will of the Almighty is always undefeated. The will of the Almighty is always undefeated. And so Augustine said, everything that happens is part of God's will. And what I think happened beginning with Augustine and certainly uh, blooming later in the Reformation was some good theology plus some Plato led us to some shaky theology. Good theology, God is all-powerful, but then part of Augustine's thing was all change, Plato said that change can only happen for the worse. And that perfection doesn't change. So things like emotions, he said, you know, God couldn't have emotions because emotions come and go. And if you're perfect, you can't go up and down. And so God doesn't have emotions. God is removed. I think if we were to drill back biblically into this, we might say that God in his unchanging nature is unchanging in his faithfulness. But that doesn't mean that there's no movement in God. And Augustine led us to this place where there's a blueprint. Now, the third piece of this, which touches our question very directly then, is the explanation for suffering. How do we explain suffering and, uh, and pain in our world? And the blueprint worldview would say that, you know, God is ultimately responsible. Suffering is on the blueprint. It's not a part that we love to think about, but it's part, if God's all-powerful and doesn't change and has always known his plan, everything is, is part of his plan. He's the ultimate cause of everything that happens. John Calvin said this, suppose a man falls among thieves or wild beasts. Suppose another man wandering through the desert finds help. Carnal reason ascribes all such happenings, whether they're prosperous or adverse, to fortune. So this is a little bit older language, but uh, to chance, whatever we might call it. But anyone who has been taught by Christ's lips will look further afield for a cause and will consider that all events are governed by God's secret plan. So if you're eaten by wild beasts, that's, that is part of God's secret plan. We may not understand it, but it is planned by God. And on the other hand, if you're rescued, that would also be planned by God. Well, if we dial forward, we see this in a really full-blown form in a way that I think puts up huge stumbling blocks for us. John Piper, a, a widely respected pastor and teacher, a widely uh, popular public speaker and writer in evangelical culture in America, said this responding to 9-11, from the smallest thing to the greatest thing, happy and sad, pain and pleasure, God governs them all for his wise and just and good purposes. And his point, in a really unambiguous way, was 9-11 is part of God's plan. Pain or good, God, God is the planner. And, and he's very, he would say that he's definitely following Calvin here. And so, that would be the way to understand it. Sandy Hook, the massacre that just happened at Sandy Hook Elementary School. James Dobson, another very widely respected speaker and you know, had a focus on the family, said this, we have turned our back on Scripture and on God Almighty, and he has allowed this judgment to fall on us. And so there's this picture that the slaughter of little kids is part of God's judgment. That there's a, a plan there. And my experience is that very often when we have a blueprint picture like this, it's painful when we experience tragedy and explain it to the others, but it can be devastating when tragedy happens in our own lives. It's like there's, like our faith just buckles underneath us. 
Brothers Karamazov, uh, one of my favorite novels, there's a character named Ivan who's battling with his brother over this exact question, and Ivan says, I renounce the higher harmony altogether. It's not worth the tears of one tortured child. He just gives up. He's like, if the world is evil, I, belief in God isn't, isn't worth my time. And I think this, this picture of God is often lurking in the background of, of popular Christianity. So I, I want to look at Jesus and see if this really holds up. Because I think if we want to see God clearly, we want to look at Jesus. He is the truest and the best revelation. He is God, and he's also our clearest picture of the Creator. And so let's look at Jesus, and I think as we look at Jesus, there are three reasons at least to rethink the blueprint picture. Three reasons at least to say, I'm, I'm not sure um, about that blueprint picture of God. And the first thing, let's, let's consider together Jesus' attitude towards the suffering. It's really interesting to me that Jesus never in the Gospels to the suffering says, this is God's secret plan for your life. He does not say to the one having seizures or the, to the one who's crippled or to the mother who's lost their child, this is, this is God's just punishment on you. He doesn't say it's because of the way, you know, the Jews voted in the last election. That's why this awful thing is happening to you. Instead, Jesus has compassion again and again and again and again. Jesus has compassion on the suffering. I, I want to read just one passage, but there, we could pick a lot of different passages. You could study the Gospels, and you know there's tons like this. Luke 13 On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman who had been there crippled by a spirit, a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. And when I think about this woman, I I imagine, you know, someone crippled in that culture, there may very well have been a lot of people who told her, you know, this is because of your life, or this is because of your family's life. Or this is because your community wasn't faithful to God. And, and you need to accept your condition because this is God's justice. This is God's secret plan. But Jesus, when he sees her, he calls her forward. And he says, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And then he places his hands on her. You know, a rabbi touching this crippled woman. Again, just breaking the taboos on the Sabbath. And he heals her. And immediately she straightened up and praised God. And then the crowd is indignant. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. The synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what had bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted because of the wonderful things he was doing. And so here's the picture of Jesus, right? Healing a woman and then saying... Of her, she's a, she's a daughter of Abraham. She's a daughter of the promise. He's humanizing her, isn't he? She's not an unrighteous one. It's not about an unrighteous community. This is a, a daughter of Abraham. And why is she crippled? Because she's been bound by Satan. Not because of God's secret plan for her life. He doesn't spin it and say, you just need to find God's goodness in this. He said, she's been bound by Satan. This is the government of darkness is why she's been bound. And then he sets her free. And then the critics say, why are you doing this on the Sabbath? And Jesus says, you hypocrites. And then 
the crowd around celebrates the wonderful things that he's doing. And I feel like we can just transpose this forward, you know, to the children at Sandy Hook. It's not this is God's justice for a nation that voted the wrong way. It's be freed from your suffering, mother and father. You're made in the image of God. Be liberated from your suffering. And to those who would question a message of mercy in a time of great pain, Jesus just says, you're all hypocrites. And earlier in the chapter, in fact, Luke 13 is written, I think, just on this question. Earlier in the chapter, it says this, starting in verse 1, some who were present on that occasion told Jesus about Galileans whom Pilate had killed while they were offering sacrifices. And Jesus says, do you think those, the suffering of those Galileans proves that they were more sinful than other Galileans? No, I tell you. Those people who were slaughtered, were they killed because they were less righteous because God wanted to show something? He said, That's not it at all. And then he says, look at your own hearts. Turn your own hearts. Look what's going on inside your own hearts. And then there's a, a similar description of a tower that falls on people. And Jesus again says, it's not because of like God's secret plan. Paraphrase, don't blame God. Look at what's going on in your own hearts. And so Jesus' treatment of the suffering would make us think, you know what, this is not, the Bible doesn't show suffering as part of God's secret plan, but rather as something that God is actually overcoming. Something that breaks God's heart. Something that grieves God. Something that Jesus has come to engage and to bring healing to. Second thing, if we think about Jesus teaching on the kingdom of God, right after, it's interesting, right after he heals this widow, so continuing in Luke chapter 13, he tells them a story. He says, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and it became a tree. And the birds perched in its branches. And what he's saying there, isn't he, is that the kingdom of God, it starts out small. And then it grows huge and provides tons of shelter. And if you were to want to paraphrase this thing, the kingdom of God, I, I think a good, a good way to think about the kingdom of God is as God's dynamic rule. God's rulership in action. The kingdom of God is God's activity in the world. It's not a place, if you look at all Jesus says about the kingdom coming, the kingdom breaking in, the kingdom is here. When you see a demon driven out, that's the kingdom of God coming upon you, Jesus says. There's this idea that the, the kingdom is God's rule. Okay. And in many parables, including this parable, you get the sense that the kingdom is already here, but it's not yet come all the way. It's already present in the ministry and message of Jesus, but it's not all the way here. The woman was crippled, kingdom not all the way here, but then she is healed and set free, kingdom breaking in. There's numerous places where Jesus says the kingdom of God, it's among you right now. But then he says in Luke chapter 20, when you see these signs in the future, you know the kingdom is near. Revelation 20 one says in heaven that God will wipe away every tear, that there will be no more death or mourning or pain or even, uh, well, or, you know, even death itself will be gone. And that at that point, the kingdom of God will be fully manifest. But until that time, we're, we're in between. I think we want to say that 9-11 is not part of the government of God. That's not God's secret plan. That is the government of darkness. Sandy Hook is not part of a secret plan God has. It's part of the government of darkness. Depression is not part of God's secret plan. It's part of the government of darkness that Jesus has come to destroy, actually, to roll back. And the final, the final thing from Jesus' 
life that I want us to look at is the cross itself. The Bible says that God sent His only Son to die on the cross, not because the world is going exactly according to God's blueprint plan, but precisely because the world is running away and rebelling against God. Jesus teaches us to pray, Your will be done, Your kingdom come, not because it is that way, but because we're to join Him in ushering that in. And the cross, if you read the passages that explain it, Jesus' cross and resurrection are consistently portrayed as an act of war on the reign of darkness. As God's response. Colossians 2 says this, When you were dead, I'll bring it up here, when you were dead because of the things you had done wrong and because your body wasn't circumcised, God made you alive with Christ and forgave all the things you had done wrong. He destroyed the record of the debt we owed with its requirements that worked against us. He canceled it by nailing it to the cross. And then verse 15 we're going to pause on. When he disarmed the rulers and authorities, he exposed them to public disgrace by leading them in a triumphal parade. The Romans crucified people to make a public spectacle of their victims and to publicly proclaim their power. And what the Bible tells us is that on the cross, the real story wasn't that a Galilean rabbi was made a spectacle by Caesar. The real story is that Satan himself and all of his armies were made a spectacle of for all of the universe to see. That the cross was the decisive victory against evil and that we are, in essence, in a cleanup phase now as that victory gets extended to the ends of the earth and to every tribe and tongue and nation. But the cross is that decisive act of war against darkness. And so we want to engage suffering not as something to passively accept, not as something to find like, okay, why would God author this in a way I don't understand, but rather as something that God is in the business of overcoming. So let's think about a better picture of God. And there's a lot to say here, and I'm just going to make two, two points, and I know there's, you know there's a lot we could talk about underneath this. But a better picture of God begins with this. God is always loving. God is always loving. 1 John 4. God is love. John 17, summarizing a chapter, Jesus has come for the purpose of making known to us the love that the Father has for Him and for us. And His prayer is that that love would not be just known, but it would actually be in us. God is always loving. Dear friends, let's love each other because love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God. The person who doesn't love does not know God because God is love. That's 1 John 4, 8. And here's, I think, one of the keys deep in the mystery of suffering and evil in this world. Love is actually the purpose of this universe. God made this universe out of love and for love. And deep in the heartbeat of love, if you think of heart of, of love as like a, I don't know, a person with a heart, like the part of the heart of love is freedom, isn't it? If you're married, if you're thinking about getting married, you know that love means freedom. If there's no actual choice there is not love part of the joy of love is a free response and a free acceptance and so i think deep in this universe is the freedom that god gives us because he loves us and us loving him has to do with 
a freedom, and that means a freedom not to be faithful as well as a freedom to be faithful. A freedom to rebel as well as a freedom to obey. And it seems that God, in His risky, relentless love, has actually, in His all-powerful nature, given to this world more freedom than we might be okay with. He's actually given to us and to the angelic beings a freedom to rebel against Him But that doesn't in any way negate the fact that he's always been loving. And this is something I think that a lot of us know in our heads, but not all of us know in our hearts. That God is deeply loving. My my heart connection came to this years ago on a Sunday morning in this church. We were worshiping. Some of you know I had a back injury skiing This is a church that prays for the sick. I'd been prayed for more times than I could count and more times than I wanted to be prayed for. I was sick of getting prayed for. While we were worshiping, like the most charismatic person at Coast, did the gorilla prayer thing, you know, snuck up behind me and prayed. I would not have gone up for prayer. She laid her hand on my back and one, I was healed, which was cool. But the thing that actually stays with me is as she prayed, I had a vision. And in the vision, I was hitting our oldest son with a baseball bat in the back. And I was just brokenhearted when I saw this picture. And I felt really clearly the Lord asking me, would you, would you hit Daniel like this? And I said, no, of course I would not. And then I felt really clearly the Spirit speak to me. I did not injure your back. And I realized right there that I had believed all along that my back injury was God's punishment for my addiction. That it was something I deserved. And I realized almost at the same time that it wasn't just about my back, but that was my basic picture of God. That God is a God who punishes those who do wrong. It was a graceless picture of God, and actually that's the God I ran away from. And the Spirit was saying to my heart, that's not, not who I am. It's not the God we see in the Gospels. It's not the God Jesus shows us. God is always loving. And the second one, second piece of a better picture of God is that God is at war against evil and suffering. 1 John 3, 8, a verse that's becoming more and more meaningful to me. God's Son appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Not to explain away the works of the devil. Not to help us accept the works of the devil. But to destroy the works of the devil. And our posture when we see our streets torn up and children murdered in the classrooms is not... not okay, this is part of God's judgment, but rather, Lord, let your kingdom come. Heal our streets. Heal our nation. Heal our families. Pour out your compassion on the wounded, Lord. Mobilize us. The reason that we're having a clothing swap out here is not just so we can have some cool community time, but so that in our generation we might see human trafficking brought to an end. So that the next generation would not have to sit on a hill and hear stories about children being bought and sold. We have seen the end of chattel slavery. We have not seen the end of ethnic injustice and racial injustice in this country. But we have seen the end of chattel slavery. May it never come back. And may we see the end of trafficking. The reason to sign up for Bridge of Hope is to roll back the works of darkness as immigrants come into our city without educational opportunities, without father figures, without any kind of consistent love. Much better to destroy the works of the darkness to create faithful, loving role models to pour into them than to try to explain later to someone who is involved in a crime and ends up in jail. This is part of God's secret plan for your life. Let us join the mission of Jesus in rolling back the works of the enemy. And there, I think, is the secret to how we think about suffering is not to just theorize about it, but to engage it. Because God did not 
theorize about our suffering. He sent his son to die for it. And he rose again to break its power. Let's all stand. Worship team, if you guys could come on up. We had a prayer training yesterday that was really great. And there was lots of examples of the kingdom come already and not yet. A woman got healed of a a back thing that was awesome. There were actually testimonies at every table about what was God, God was doing in surprising ways. Many people who had never prayed in that way before saw God do things that were surprising and awesome. And toward the end, Brian, uh, Brian and Amy, who lead our prayer ministry, we were talking about prayer requests for people we know. And Brian said, I, I hope that my non-Christian friends, they all have an experience with God they'll never forget. That phrase has just stuck with me. I would love to see all of our friends have experiences with God they'll never forget. In our workplaces and in our neighborhoods. Experiences with God that they'll never forget. Experiences of depression being broken away. Experiences of addiction being unlocked. Experiences of healing that are utterly surprising. Destroying the works of darkness. Let's be a community that follows Jesus into the suffering world. Because we're we're how the world sees God. One of my favorite writers says that the church is the hermeneutic of the gospel, which which just boiled down means we're the way the skeptical culture sees God. And how we live, that's the picture. Let's let's follow Jesus in His love and compassion and in His mission, breaking darkness wherever we find it. So Lord, would You come as we worship? Would You pour out Your Spirit? And Lord, would the victory of your cross stand bright in our hearts and in our minds? Would you release hope? Would you give comfort in our deepest places? In Jesus' name. In Romans 8.28 says, God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I don't think that, that verse doesn't mean that God authors the suffering in our lives, but it does mean that God redeems the suffering in our lives. There's a big difference between planning and buying back. This morning, if you have a place where you're hurting, uh, we'd love to pray for you. As we were praying earlier, uh, we spent some time before the service just praying for anybody who has been blamed for their suffering, like this is your fault. And we'd really love to pray for you. The Lord has freedom for you. There may also be a person or two here, maybe more, who have never trusted in God's goodness. You've always seen a picture of God that was maybe only marginally good. Or maybe you didn't believe was good. We'd love to pray for you. The God who made the universe is a trustworthy God. A God who joins us. A God who sent his son for us. That we might have life and have it to the full. So let's hold hands across the aisles. I'll close us and then anybody who would like prayer, come on up and we'll just spend as much time praying as, uh, as we want to. We hold hands as a sign that we are a community. We're a community that Jesus sends into this world to heal the sick, to drive out demons 
to give to the poor. Freely you have received, Jesus says. Now freely give. So Lord, would you cause the hope of your resurrection to stand in front of us, Lord? Would you give us courage to overcome darkness, Lord? in our own lives and in the world around us. Lord, you are the God of all comfort. Would you pour out comfort in our lives where we are? In your name, Jesus. Amen. So if you'd like prayer, come on up. Uh, if you're headed out, have a great week.